Our speakers tonight will be Eugene Cook of Grow Where You Are, Dr. Casey Taft of Vegan Publishers, Ashley Caps of Free From Harm and A Well-Fed World, and Wayne Chung of Direct Action Everywhere. We'll hear from each of our speakers for 15 to 20 minutes, and then we'll move on to a question and answer panel discussion. So we'll first welcome Eugene Cook. Eugene is an urban agriculture expert and the co-founder of Grow Where You Are, an Atlanta-based nonprofit developing local veganic food systems. Grow Where You Are is a social enterprise collective dedicated to increasing ecological sustainability, advancing food justice, and teaching the skills necessary to grow and prepare health-giving foods in underserved communities. Let's give a warm welcome to Eugene. Am I ready? Oh, wonderful. All right. Um, greetings, y'all. It's a, it's a, it's a, I'm fortunate. I'm really fortunate to be here. And um, I want to thank the people that have organized this amazing event because I have known nothing about this prior to this, you know? And um, I have been fortunate enough to do the work that I do growing food for about 20 years now in a lot of different places around the world. And because it's 2017 and we have all these different um, ways of communicating and interfacing through social media and other forms of technology people come to find out about each other without actually meeting each other um, so I met I think brother Paul from brother wolf here um, and I'm grateful to be here I'm grateful to see good people from a well-fed world and and people that have made it possible for me to be here I have to start by thanking um, and also acknowledging how how many of you were here for the previous panel like 15 minutes ago? Hands up, okay, good. So then we're gonna start from there. One of the things that really impressed me, um, once I actually got a chance to sit down and read the emails that I've gotten from the uh, Asheville Vegan Fest was finding out that Chris Hedges was gonna be here. Um, because for me, when I look at the work that we're doing as an organization, Grow Where You Are, it's based on the conditions of the life of the people that are that make up the organization, that make up the group. Um, and that can't be separated from being here in the United States of America. How many of you were born and raised in the United States of America? All right, so was I. Um, you have, anybody have a, a smartphone or an iPhone? Yeah, good, all right. So anybody on Instagram? Anybody on Instagram? Instagram, Instagram, okay. So grow where you are, all spelt out. Grow where you are. That way you can look at a bunch of pictures while I talk and you won't have to focus on me and you'll get a very clear idea of what we have done and how we've started. Anybody familiar with the work of Grow Where You Are yet? Few people, oh, so, okay, so growwhereyouare.farm, F-A-R-M, growwhereyouare.farm and you can find out some work. What we do is we grow food um, using agroecological practices and veganic agriculture in urban areas and peri-urban and suburban areas. And we do that because it's important for us to know that we can take our own health into our own hands. Um, the specifics of that being, I became a father for the first time 18 years ago. And that young man just graduated high school yesterday in, Los in Pasadena, California. So, thank you. <laughs> it's a good thing. It's a good thing. And um, so I just flew in this morning from, from California. And he is the very reason that I started to grow food. So I knew nothing about Monsanto or GMOs or what's happening in animal agriculture. I knew none of that. That was not my motivation. My motivation was Samantha came to me and said, we're going to have a child. And I went out into our backyard in California and started planting food because my folks had taught me how to plant food. They had taught me how to keep a small garden in suburban California um, because they come from a tradition of farmers throughout the Midwest and the South. And the only reason my mother was able to get out of Chautauqua, Kansas, get out of Oklahoma on an 80 acre farm was because her folks had land. And then she was the first person in her entire family to go to college. Her going to college meant she moved to California, meant she met my father. And I think they did some kind of special chemistry thing and I was born. Um, so that was good, that's a good thing. 
The point is the land. For me, the point is the land. So I heard some amazing things on the panel that just passed, uh, that was just previous to us, and some of it was extraordinarily accurate, and some of it speaks to the deep ignorance of people who are the beneficiaries of systemic thievery. So, the idea that people of color now need to come into the vegan movement is ludicrous. And I'll speak from my own personal experience since this is about advocacy. The reason I stopped eating meat was because an amazing prophet named KRS-One. Anybody familiar? Right, right, right. You ever heard the song Beef? Yeah, that song Beef came out in like 88, 86. How many of you have been vegan since 88? Not too many hands. So... I didn't hear about that from nobody white. <laughs> I heard about that from a brother from Brooklyn, from, from Bronx, from, you know, who understood that we can't eat animals because animals are terrified when they're being killed. And if you eat an, a terrified animal, then you're going to be walking through your neighborhood looking over your shoulder. And he was tired of seeing us as a subset of this tyrannical government being totally fear-based all the time and being cowards in our communities and in, in this nation. So that was the, my first hit about becoming a vegetarian. Anybody ever heard of this man? He's now gone viral. His name is Maka B. Maka B, talking about the cucumber, the cucumber. Yeah, yeah, you know, right? So again, Rastafarian culture has been speaking about a vegetarian, ital, no salt diet since 60s. Since the 60s. So to sit in here in Asheville and hear people tell me that we really got to get people of color involved in this movement, that's, a, that's letting you know where you're coming from and how far off the mark you are. Just a little wake-up call. Google Queen Afua. Google Dr. Sebi. Google Dr. B. Google Dr. Phil Valentine. Google Aris Latham. All of these brothers and sisters have been talking about this based on a tradition of a spiritual group of people who come from, they say there's more Jamaicans off the island of Jamaica in the world than there are on the island of Jamaica. You can go anywhere in this world, London, China, anywhere, and you're going to find some Rasta that has a spot where they're selling, selling vegetarian cuisine. So... Y'all are not bringing anything new. What you're bringing is, is, a con is the same consciousness that has us killing animals. And it's a consciousness that once you woke up, you suddenly saw, oh, there's a world, and you figure you were the first one to wake up. Because the voices that have been saying this since the 60s, the 70s, and the 80s, all through hip-hop, all through everything, were not voices that you wanted to listen to. And so to assume that people in your family and in your communities are going to want to hear your voice, I suggest that you learn how to rhyme <laughs> and make really good beats. Because when KRS-One was talking, he was talking to a population of young black teenagers like myself who I was not thinking about stopping eating meat or chicken or fish. But he made it irresistible for me to absorb the information based on the fact that he put it over music and he found intelligent, creative ways to get that information out. Maccabi, a grown Rastafarian man, is doing the exact same thing. And if you look at his tube on YouTube, it has Wami Eat Wednesdays and Medical Mondays. He says, because as a vegan, everybody always asks him, what do you eat, what do you eat? And he says, let me tell you Wami Eat. Wami Eat, I eat cucumber, I eat, I eat mango, I eat cayenne pepper. And then he tells you exactly what it's good for, but he says it in a rhyme. And if you, if you look at any of Bob Marley's music, he says, eating up, the problem is, is that we're eating up all the flesh from off the earth. He says it right in a song. That was in the 70s. So if we're in 2017 and we find ourselves wondering about how to be advocates and what advocacy is, what advocacy is, is finally coming to a place where you are ready to concede leadership to the people who have always been framing and creating culture 
on this Turtle Island continent that we call North America. There are indigenous people, there are um, descendants of African people, and there are an amazing mix that I make up of those people who have always lived plant-based, who have always taught balance with the planet, who have always taught compassion, which is the reason you are not dead. Because if we acted or reacted violently to violence, as the brother Gary, I think his name was, the, the gentleman who was up here before, as he said, then if violence created, could solve a situation, we'd be living in the Garden of Eden, right? And if there weren't peaceful, humble, spiritually guided people on this continent, none of y'all would be in this room. As a matter of fact, you'd be in danger of me being here. Because I'm in a room full of what I could very easily look at as my generational enemies and their children. And I could have planned and plotted anything to happen. Vice versa. How many of you have been in a Masonic hall full of black people and had to talk to them? Just raise your hand. Okay, so you have no idea what I'm feeling and you can't know at all what stimulates or motivates the people that are doing this work and have been doing it without any support, financial or otherwise. No microphones, no books, no nothing. But these people have been doing it. We've been doing it. We've been doing it. We've been doing it. And we've been pleading to y'all to become more humane. There's an amazing reggae uh, group called Midnight. And he says, humanitarians saving whales. What about humanity? How can you be a humanitarian and you're looking to save the whales? And when you see young black children being assassinated by terrified, cowardly white men, nothing happens. So advocacy for me is living it, moving in it consistently every day. So what Grow Where You Are does is we plant food in the very areas that we live amongst the communities that need it the most and we make sure that the food gets out to them. By, by creating these spaces, oftentimes in partnerships with faith-based institutions that own land, we create spaces that people can see in their everyday just walking pedestrian traffic. They can see food growing and there's access to it. There's no fences or any of that kind of stuff and people can come and have that experience with the plants and with the people. What makes it tenuous and challenging? What do you think is our number one challenge? Land what? Land, land ownership, land access. There was a gentleman who decided he wanted to take five minutes earlier in the other presentation to ask two questions. But what he really did was monopolize the stage and talk about his ideas about what democracy is and how property ownership is fundamental to democracy. Thankfully, we had intelligent people on the stage that could refute that and understand that property ownership did never, ever create democracy. Property ownership created an, a ruling class and subjugated class, which now you all are sliding into being that. And that don't feel good. I'm sure it don't. I'm sure it's uncomfortable because you thought that maybe was this, thing, this American trick was going to work, but it can't. It don't work for the animals, it don't work for the women, it don't work for the men who don't own property. So here we have a situation where how do we advocate amongst our collective body in the United States when we are not a collective body? When we automatically, even in spaces like this, have people who believe that, well, we gotta own property, otherwise we won't have a democracy. When there is a constitution and federations that predate any European settlement that told exactly how to live. Has anybody ever read the Iroquois um, Constitution? Yeah, well it says, number one, the only people who are supposed to put people into power and take them out are the women. The chiefs are selected by the women and disposed of by the women. The only other male that can vote on a chief is the 
seating chief. He's the only one who has a say, only man who has a say over what chief is coming in. Otherwise, it's the council of women, the council of female elders that grow a young man up to be chief. And if he doesn't act right, they take him out of that position. What would America be like if only women could vote for president? So this idea that there was no democracy here without property ownership and that we did, there was no way of, of governing land, natural resources, caring for animals, caring for our elderly and our children until people decided to create property ownership, that's a falsehood. And if we're moving on falsehoods from the very beginning, especially in spaces like this where we profess to want and be moving with compassion, then it's like we're crippling ourselves because we're totally misinformed. You all, I'm sure, are compassionate people. But if we're agreeing that information is one of the most important tools that we have, then you got to know where you live. Standing Rock was not just some accident. It hasn't gone anywhere. And the people who are ready to move us all collectively into a new space, they already exist. Dr. Vandana Shiva has, has, has talks on YouTube about strictly about being a vegetarian, right? So there's, there's a lot of work being done by a lot of people. Our advocacy is personally making sure that we have the garden spaces and the mini farms available that people can come to and see that we don't use any animal fertilizers or any of that kind of thing, see how vibrant the food is. And at the same time, when they come in and we have people who say they want to support the work, we make it very clear to them that one of the number one issues for any new farmers, young farmers coming up, especially urban farmers, is land access and ownership. Most urban farmers are renting somewhere and then driving to a farm where they work. That will never work. And that issue of land ownership has also been fundamental to everything that y'all are talking about when it comes to the safety of these animals. Because all of these horrible conditions that these animals are facing are happening on land that these corporations say that they own. And if they didn't have that legal ownership of it, if you want to continue to go through legal channels, you'd have a lot better ch chance. But as long as we agree with the fact that they own the land and what goes on on that land, they can they decide how, it, how it's done and how many animals that they want to torture, then we're acquiescing to something that has been artificial from the start. My last point on advocacy is these, this hairstyle is the Bantu knots. The Bantu are a people of West Africa who have consistently done amazing things. And you'll find that throughout the continent. So for us, simply waking up in the skin that I'm in and entering into a space like this and realizing that until I got onto this stage, how, how I was engaged with, right? I was engaged with very differently because people maybe didn't know who I was and why I was here. But I'm here to share, I'm here to talk, I'm here to learn. So remember KRS-One, remember Dead Prez. Dead Prez, their album that came out in 1992, I think it was called Let's Get Free. The whole album is about vegetarianism, but it's wrapped in the larger movement of social justice, the apartheid that we live in here in the United States, and the, the, as the gentleman talked about, the, the generational wealth inequity that has happened because of stolen property continually being inherited from people who had no idea how to interact with this particular landmass because you're foreigners to it. And there are people who want to help. They want to show you and I how to, how to behave here. And they've been there, always been present. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Eugene.